The Boy The Elf Sunday, March 20th Once there was a boy. He was, let us say, something like fourteen years old, long and loose-jointed and tow-headed. He wasn't good for much, that boy. His chief delight was to eat and sleep, and after that he liked best to make mischief. It was a Sunday morning, and the boy's parents were getting ready to go to the church. The boy sat on the edge of the table in his shirt sleeves, and thought how lucky it was that both father and mother were going away, and the coast would be clear for a couple of hours. Good, now I can take down Pop's gun and fire off a shot without anybody's meddling interference, he said to himself. But it was almost as if father should have guessed the boy's thoughts, for just as he was on the threshold, ready to start, he stopped short and turned toward the boy. "'Since you won't come to church with mother and me,' he said, "'the least you can do is to read the service at home. "'Will you promise to do so?' "'Yes,' said the boy, "'that I can do easy enough.' And he thought, of course, that he wouldn't read any more than he felt like reading. The boy thought that never had he seen his mother so persistent. In a second she was over by the shelf near the fireplace, and took down Luther's commentary and laid it on the table in front of the window, open at the service for the day. She also opened the New Testament and placed it beside the commentary. Finally she drew up the big armchair, which was bought at the parish auction the year before, and which, as a rule, no one but father was permitted to occupy. The boy sat thinking that his mother was giving herself altogether too much trouble with this spread, for he had no intention of reading more than a page or so. But now, for the second time, it was almost as if his father were able to see right through him. He walked up to the boy and said in a severe tone, Now remember that you are to read carefully for when we come back I shall question you thoroughly, and if you have skipped a single page it will not go well with you. The service is fourteen and a half pages long, said his mother, just as if she wanted to heap up the measure of his misfortune. You'll have to sit down and begin the reading at once, if you expect to get through with it. With that they departed, and as the boy stood in the doorway watching them, he thought that he had been caught in a trap. There they go, congratulating themselves, I suppose, in the belief that they've hit upon something so good that I'll be forced to sit and hang over the sermon the whole time that they are away, thought he. But his father and mother were certainly not congratulating themselves upon anything of the sort but on the contrary they were very much distressed they were poor farmers and their place was not much bigger than a garden plot when they first moved there the place couldn't feed more than one pig and a pair of chickens but they were uncommonly industrious and capable folk and now they had both cows and geese things had turned out very well for them and they would have gone to church that beautiful morning, satisfied and happy, if they hadn't had their son to think of. Father complained that he was dull and lazy. He had not cared to learn anything at school, and he was such an all-round good-for-nothing that he could barely be made to tend geese. Mother did not deny that this was true, but she was most distressed because he was wild and bad, cruel to animals and ill-willed toward human beings. May God soften his hard heart and give him a better disposition, said the mother, or else he will be a misfortune, both to himself and to us. The boy stood for a long time and pondered whether he should read the service or not. Finally he came to the conclusion that this time it was best to be obedient. He seated himself in the easy chair and began to read. But when he had been reading away in an undertone for a little while, this mumbling seemed to have a soothing effect upon him, and he began to nod. It was the most beautiful weather outside. 
It was only the 20th of March, but the boy lived in West Vemminghög township down in southern Skåne, where the spring was already in full swing. It was not as yet green, but it was fresh and budding. There was water in all the trenches, and the colt's foot on the edge of the ditch was in bloom. All the weeds that grew in among the stones were brown and shiny. The beech woods in the distance seemed to swell and grow thicker with every second. The skies were high and a clear blue. The cottage door stood ajar, and the lark's trill could be heard in the room. The hens, the geese pattered about in the yard, and the cows, who felt the spring air away in their stalls, lowed their approval every now and then. The boy read and nodded, and fought against drowsiness. No, I don't want to fall asleep, thought he, for then I'll not get through with this thing the whole forenoon. But somehow he fell asleep. He did not know whether he had slept a short while or a long while, but he was awakened by hearing a slight noise back of him. On the window sill facing the boy stood a small looking glass, and almost the entire cottage could be seen in this. As the boy raised his head, he happened to look in the glass, and then he saw that the covers to his mother's chest had been opened. His mother owned a great heavy iron-bound oak chest which she permitted no one but herself to open. Here she treasured all the things she had inherited from her mother, and of these she was especially careful. Here lay a couple of old-time peasant dresses of red homespun cloth, with short bodice and plaited shirt, and a pearl-bedecked breastpin. There were starched white linen headdresses and heavy silver ornaments and chains. Folks don't care to go about dressed like that in these days, and several times his mother had thought of getting rid of the old things, but somehow she hadn't had the heart to do it. Now the boy saw distinctly in the glass that the chest lid was open. He could not understand how this had happened, for his mother had closed the chest before she went away. She never would have left that precious chest open when he was at home alone. He became low-spirited and apprehensive. He was afraid that a thief had sneaked his way into the cottage. He didn't dare to move, but sat still and stared into the looking-glass. While he sat there and waited for the thief to make his appearance, he began to wonder what that dark shadow was which fell across the edge of the chest. He looked and looked, and did not want to believe his eyes. But the thing, which at first seemed shadowy, became more and more clear to him, and soon he saw that it was something real. It was no less a thing than an elf who sat there astride the edge of the chest. To be sure, the boy had heard stories about elves, but he had never dreamt that they were such tiny creatures. He was no taller than a hand's breadth, this one who sat on the edge of the chest. He had an old, wrinkled, and beardless face, and was dressed in a black frock coat, knee-breeches, and a broad-rimmed black hat. He was very trim and smart, with his white laces about the throat and wristbands, his buckled shoes, and the bows on his garters. He had taken from the chest an embroidered piece, and sat and looked at the old-fashioned handiwork, with such an air of veneration that he did not observe the boy had awakened. The boy was somewhat surprised to see the elf, but, on the other hand, he was not particularly frightened. It was impossible to be afraid of one who was so little, and since the elf was so absorbed in his own thoughts that he neither saw nor heard, the boy thought that it would be great fun to play a trick on him, to push him over into the chest and shut the lid on him or something of that kind. But the boy was not so courageous that he dared to touch the elf with his hands. Instead, he looked around the room for something to poke him with. He let his gaze wander from the sofa to the leaf-table, from the leaf-table to the fireplace. He looked at the kettles, then at the coffee-urn, which stood on a shelf near the fireplace. 
on the water bucket near the door and on the spoons and knives and forks and saucers and plates which could be seen through the half-open cupboard door he looked at his father's gun which hung on the wall beside the portrait of the danish royal family and on the geraniums and fuchsias which blossomed in the window and last he caught sight of an old butterfly snare that hung on the window frame he had hardly set eyes on that butterfly snare before he reached over and snatched it and jumped up and swung it alongside the edge of the chest. He was himself astonished at the luck he had. He hardly knew how he had managed it, but he had actually snared the elf. The poor little chap lay head downward in the bottom of the long snare and could not free himself. The first moment the boy hadn't the least idea what he should do with this prize. He was only particular to swing the snare backward and forward to prevent the elf from getting a foothold and clambering up. The elf began to speak and begged, oh, so pitifully for his freedom. He had brought them good luck these many years, he said, and deserved better treatment. Now, if the boy would set him free, he would give him an old coin, a silver spoon and a gold penny, as big as the case of his father's silver watch. The boy didn't think that this was much of an offer, but it so happened that after he had forgotten the elf in his power, he was afraid of him. He felt that he had entered into an agreement with something weird and uncanny, something which did not belong to his world, and he was only too glad to get rid of the horrid thing. For this reason he agreed at once to the bargain, and held the snare still, so that the elf could crawl out of it. But when the elf was almost out of the snare, the boy happened to think that he ought to have bargained for large estates and all sorts of good things. He should at least have made this stipulation that the elf must conjure the sermon into his head. What a fool I was to let him go, thought he, and began to shake the snare violently so the elf would tumble down again. But the instant the boy did this, he received such a stinging box on the air that he thought his head would fly in pieces. He was dashed first against one wall, then against the other. He sank to the floor and lay there, senseless. When he awoke, he was alone in the cottage. The chest lid was down, and the butterfly snare hung in its usual place by the window. If he had not felt how the right cheek burned, from that box on the air, he would been have tempted to believe the whole thing had been a dream. At any rate, father and mother will be sure to insist that it was nothing else, thought he. They are not likely to make any allowances for that old sermon on account of the elf. It is best for me to get at that reading again, thought he. But as he walked toward the table, he noticed something remarkable. It couldn't be possible that the cottage had grown. But why was he obliged to take so many more steps than usual to get to the table? And what was the matter with the chair? It looked no bigger than it did a while ago. But now he had to step on the rung first and then clamber up in order to reach the seat. It was the same thing with the table. He could not look over the top without climbing to the arm of the chair. "'What in all the world is this?' said the boy. "'I believe the elf has bewitched both the armchair and the table and the whole cottage.' The commentary lay on the table, and to all appearances it was not changed. But there must have been something queer about that too, for he could not manage to read a single word of it without actually standing right in the book itself. He read a couple of lines, and then he chanced to look up. With that his glance fell on the looking-glass, and then he cried aloud, "'Look, there's another one!' For in the glass he saw plainly a little, little creature who was dressed in a hood and leather breeches. "'Why, that one is dressed exactly like me!' said the boy, and clasped his hands in astonishment. But then he saw that the thing in the mirror did the same thing. Then he began to pull his hair and pinch his arms and swing round, and instantly he did the same thing after him, he who was seen in the mirror. 
The boy ran around the glass several times to see if there wasn't a little man hidden behind it. But he found no one there, and then he began to shake with terror, for now he understood that the elf had bewitched him, and that the creature whose image he saw in the glass was he himself. THE WILD GEESE The boy simply could not make himself believe that he had been transformed into an elf. It can't be anything but a dream, a queer fancy, thought he. If I wait a few moments, I'll surely be turned back into a human being again. He placed himself before the glass and closed his eyes. He opened them again after a couple of minutes, and then expected to find that it had all passed over, but it hadn't. He was and remained just as little. In other respects he was the same as before. The thin, straw-coloured hair, the freckles across his nose, the patches on his leather breeches, and the darns on his stockings were all like themselves, with the exception that they had become diminished. No, it would do no good for him to stand still and wait. Of this he was certain. He must try something else, and he thought the wisest thing that he could do was to try and find the elf and make his peace with him. And while he sought, he cried and prayed and promised everything he could think of. Never more would he break his word to anyone. Never again would he be naughty. And never, never would he fall asleep again over the sermon. If he might only be a human being once more, he would be such a good and helpful and obedient boy. But no matter how much he promised, it did not help him the least little bit. Suddenly he remembered that he had heard his mother say all the tiny folk made their home in the cowsheds, and at once he concluded to go there and see if he couldn't find the elf. It was a lucky thing that the cottage door stood partly open, for he never could have reached the bolt and opened it, but now he slipped through without any difficulty. When he came out in the hallway, he looked around for his wooden shoes for in the house, to be sure, he had gone about in his stocking feet. He wondered how he should manage with these big, clumsy wooden shoes. But just then he saw a pair of tiny shoes on the doorstep. When he observed that the elf had been so thoughtful that he had also bewitched the wooden shoes, he was even more troubled. It was evidently his intention that this affliction should last a long time. On the wooden boardwalk in front of the cottage hopped a grey sparrow. He had hardly set eyes on the boy before he called out, Titi, Titi, look at Nils Goosey boy, look at Thumbitot, look at Nils Holgersson, Thumbitot. Instantly both the geese and the chicken turned and stared at the boy, and then they set up a fearful cackling. Cookly coo cried the rooster. Good enough for him, cockily coo! Good enough for him, cockily coo! He has pulled my comb. Ka 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 da! Serves him right! cried the hens. And with that they kept up a continuous cackle. The geese got together in a tight group, stuck their heads together, and asked, Who can have done this? Who can have done this? But the strangest thing of all was that the boy understood what they said. He was so astonished that he stood there as if rooted to the doorstep and listened. It must be because I am changed into an elf, said he. This is probably why I understand bird talk. He thought it was unbearable that the hens would not stop saying that it served him right. He threw a stone at them and shouted, Shut up, you pack! But it hadn't occurred to him before that he was no longer the sort of boy the hens need fear. The whole hen-yard made a rush for him and formed a ring around him. Then they all cried at once, Kakakata, serve you right! Kakadada, serve you right! The boy tried to get away, but the chickens ran after him and screamed until he thought he'd lose his hearing. It is more than likely that he never could have gone away from them if the house-cat hadn't come along just then. 
As soon as the chickens saw the cat, they quieted down and pretended to be thinking of nothing else than just to scratch in the earth for worms. Immediately the boy ran up to the cat. "'You dear pussy,' said he, "'you must know all the corners and hiding places about here. You'll be a good little kitty, and tell me where I can find the elf.' The cat did not reply at once. He seated himself, curled his tail into a graceful ring around his paw, and stared at the boy. It was a large black cat with one white spot on his chest. His fur lay sleek and soft and shone in the sunlight. The claws were drawn in, and the eyes were a dull grey, with a just a little narrow dark streak down the centre. The cat looked thoroughly good-natured and inoffensive. "'I know well enough where the elf lives,' he said in a soft voice, "'but that doesn't say that I am going to tell you about it.' "'Dear pussy, you must tell me where the elf lives,' said the boy. "'Can't you see how he has bewitched me?' The cat opened his eyes a little, so that the green wickedness began to shine forth. He spun round and purred with satisfaction before he replied. "'Shall I perhaps help you, because you have so often grabbed me by the tail?' he said at last. Then the boy was furious and forgot entirely how little and helpless he was now. "'Oh, I can pull your tail again. I can,' said he, and ran toward the cat. The next instant the cat was so changed that the boy could scarcely believe it was the same animal. Every separate hair on his body stood on end. The back was bent. The legs had become elongated. The claws scraped the ground. The tail had grown thick and short, the ears were laid back, the mouth was frothy, and the eyes were wide open and glistened like sparks of red fire. The boy didn't want to let himself be scared by the cat, and he took a step forward. Then the cat made one spring and landed right on the boy, knocked him down and stood over him, his forepaws on his chest and his jaws wide apart over his throat. The boy felt how the sharp claws sank through his vest and shirt and into his skin, and how the sharp eye-teeth tickled his throat. He shrieked for help as loudly as he could, but no one came. He thought surely that his last hour had come. Then he felt that the cat drew in his claws and let go the hold on his throat. There, he said, that will do now. I'll let you go this time, for my mistress's sake. I only wanted you to know which one of us two has the power now. With that the cat walked away, looking as smooth and pious as he did when he first appeared on the scene. The boy was so crestfallen that he didn't say a word, but only hurried to the cowhouse to look for the elf. There were not more than three cows, all told, but when the boy came in, there was such a bellowing and such a kick-up that one might easily have believed that there were at least thirty. Moo! 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 bellowed Mayrose. It is well there is such a thing as justice in this world. Moo! 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 sang the three of them in unison. He couldn't hear what they said, for each one tried to outbellow the others. The boy wanted to ask after the elf, but he couldn't make himself heard, because the cows were in full uproar. They carried on as they used to do when he let a strange dog in on them. They kicked with their hind legs, shook their necks, stretched their heads, and measured the distance with their horns. "'Come here now,' said Mayrose, "'and you'll get a kick that you won't forget in a hurry. Come here!' said Gold Lily, and you shall dance on my horns. Come here, and you shall taste how it felt when you threw your wooden shoes at me, as you did last summer, bawled Star. Come here, and you shall be repaid for that wasp you let loose in my ear, growled Gold Lily. Mayrose was the oldest and the wisest of them, 
and she was the very maddest. "'Come here,' said she, "'that I may pay you back for the many times that you have jerked the milk pail away from your mother, and for all the snares you laid for her when she came carrying the milk pails, and for all the tears when she had stood here and wept over you.' The boy wanted to tell them how he regretted that he had been unkind to them, and that never, never from now on should he be anything but good if they would only tell him where the elf was. But the cows didn't listen to him. They made such a racket that he began to fear one of them would succeed in breaking loose, and he thought that the best thing for him to do was to go quietly away from the cowhouse. When he came out, he was thoroughly disheartened. He could understand that no one on the place wanted to help him find the elf, and little good would it do him, probably, if the elf were found. He crawled up on the broad hedge which fenced in the farm, and which was overgrown with briars and lichen. There he sat down to think about how it would go with him. If he never became a human being again, when father and mother came home from church, there would be a surprise for them. Yes, a surprise. It would be all over the land, and people would come flocking from East Veminghög and from Torp and from Skerup. The whole Veminghög township would come to stare at him. Perhaps father and mother would take him with them and show him at the marketplace in Chivik. No, that was too horrible to think about. He would rather that no human being should ever see him again. His unhappiness was simply frightful. No one in all the world was so unhappy as he. He was no longer a human being, but a freak. Little by little he began to comprehend what it meant to be no longer human. He was separated from everything now. He could no longer play with other boys. He could not take charge of the farm after his parents were gone, and certainly no girl would think of marrying him. He sat and looked at his home. It was a little log house, which lay as if it had been crushed down to earth, under the high sloping roof. The outhouses were also small, and the patches of ground were so narrow that a horse could barely turn around on them. But little and poor though the place was, it was much too good for him now. He couldn't ask for any better place than a hole under the stable floor. It was wondrously beautiful weather. It budded, and it rippled, and it murmured, and it twittered all around him. But he sat there with such a heavy sorrow. He should never be happy any more about anything. Never had he seen the skies as blue as they were today. Birds of passage came on their travels. They came from foreign lands and had travelled over the East Sea by way of Smygehuk, and were now on their way north. They were of many different kinds, but he was only familiar with the wild geese, who came flying in two long rows, which met at an angle. Several flocks of wild geese had already flown by. They flew very high. Still he could hear how they shrieked. To the hills! Now we're off to the hills! When the wild geese saw the tame geese, who walked about the farm, they sank nearer the earth and called, Come along, come along, we're off to the hills! The tame geese could not resist the temptation to raise their heads and listen, but they answered very sensibly, we're pretty well off where we are we're pretty well off where we are it was as we have said an uncommonly fine day with an atmosphere that it must have been a real delight to fly in so light and bracing and with each new wild geese flock that flew by the tame geese became more and more unruly a couple of times they flapped their wings as if they had half a mind to fly along but then an old mother goose would always say to them, Now, don't be silly. Those creatures will have to suffer both hunger and cold. There was a young gander whom the wild geese had fired with a passion for adventure. If another flock comes this way, I'll follow them, said he. 
Then there came a new flock who shrieked like the others, and the young gander answered, Wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm coming. He spread his wings and raised himself into the air, but he was so unaccustomed to flying that he fell to the ground again. At any rate the wild geese must have heard his call, for they turned and flew back slowly to see if he was coming. Wait, wait, he cried, and made another attempt to fly. All this the boy heard, where he lay on the hedge. It would be a great pity, thought he, if the big goosey gander should go away. It would be a big loss to father and mother if he was gone when they came home from church. When he thought of this, once again he entirely forgot that he was little and helpless. He took one leap right down into the goose flock and threw his arms around the neck of the goosey gander. Oh, no! you don't fly away this time sir cried he but just then the gander was considering how he should go to work to raise himself from the ground he couldn't stop to shake the boy off hence he had to go along with him up in the air they bore on toward the heights so rapidly that the boy fairly gasped before he had time to think that he ought to let go his hold around the gander's neck he was so high up that he would have been killed instantly if he had fallen to the ground the only thing that he could do to make himself a little more comfortable was to try and get upon the gander's back and there he wriggled himself forthwith but not without considerable trouble and it was not an easy matter either to hold himself secure on the slippery back between two swaying wings he had to dig deep into feathers and down with both hands to keep from tumbling to the ground. THE BIG CHECKED CLOTH The boy had grown so giddy that it was a long while before he came to himself. The winds howled and beat against him, and the rustle of feathers and swaying of wings sounded like a whole storm. Thirteen geese flew around him, flapping their wings and honking. They danced before his eyes, and they buzzed in his ears. He didn't know whether they flew high or low, or in what direction they were travelling. After a bit he regained just enough sense to understand that he ought to find out where the geese were taking him. But this was not so easy, for he didn't know how he should ever muster up courage enough to look down. He was sure he'd faint if he attempted it. The wild geese were not flying very high, because the new travelling companion could not breathe in the very thinnest air. For his sake they also flew a little slower than usual. At last the boy just made himself cast one glance down to earth. Then he thought that a great big rug lay spread beneath him, which was made up of an incredible number of large and small checks. Where in all the world am I now? he wondered. He saw nothing but check upon check. Some were broad and ran crosswise, and some were long and narrow, all over. There were angles and corners. Nothing was round, and nothing was crooked. "'What kind of big checked cloth is this that I am looking down on?' said the boy to himself, without expecting anyone to answer him. But instantly the wild geese who flew about him called out, "'Fields and meadows! Fields and meadows!' Then he understood that the big check cloth he was travelling over was the flat land of southern Sweden, and he began to comprehend why it looked so checked and multicoloured. The bright green checks he recognised first, they were rye fields that had been sown in the fall, and had kept themselves green under the winter snows. The yellowish-grey checks were stubble fields, the remains of the oat crop which had grown there the summer before. The brownish ones were old clover meadows, and the black ones deserted grazing lands or ploughed up fallow pastures. The brown checks with the yellow edges were undoubtedly beech tree forest, for in these you'll find the big trees which grow in the heart of the forest, naked in the winter, while the little beech trees which grow along the borders keep their dry yellowed leaves way into the spring. There were also dark checks with grey centres. These were the large built-up estates encircled by the small cottages with their blackening straw roofs, 
and their stone divided land plots and then there were check screen in the middle with brown borders these were the orchards where the grass carpets were already turning green although the trees and bushes around them were still in their nude brown bark the boy could not keep from laughing when he saw how checked everything looked but when the wild geese heard him laugh they called out kind of reprovingly fertile and good land fertile and good land the boy had already become serious to think that you can laugh you who have met with the most terrible misfortune that can possibly happen to a human being thought he and for a moment he was pretty serious but it wasn't long before he was laughing again now that he had grown somewhat accustomed to the ride and the speed so that he could think of something besides holding himself on the gander's back he began to notice how full the air was of birds flying northward and there was a shouting and calling from flock to flock so you came over today shrieked some yes answered the geese how do you think the spring is getting on not a leaf on the trees and ice cold water in the lakes came back the answer when the geese flew over a place where they saw any tame half-naked fowl they shouted what's the name of this place what's the name of this place then the rooster cocked their heads and answered its name's lilligard this year the same as last year most of the cottages were probably named after their owners which is the custom in skåne but instead of saying this is permatsons or ola bossons the roosters hit upon the kind of names which to their way of thinking were more appropriate those who lived on small farms and belonged to poor cottages cried this plaid is called grain scares and those who belonged to the poorest hut dwellers screamed the name of this place is little to eat little to eat little to eat the big well-cared-for farms got high-sounding names from the roosters such as lucky meadows eggberia and moneyville but the roosters on the great landed estates were too high and mighty to condescend to anything like jesting one of them crowed and called out with such gusto that it sounded as if he wanted to be heard clear up to the sun this is her debeck's estate the same this year as last year this year as last year a little further on strutted one rooster crowd this is van holm surely all the world knows that the boy observed that the geese did not fly straight forward but zigzagged hither and thither over the whole south country just as though they were glad to be in skåne again and wanted to pay their respects to every separate place they came to one place where there were a number of big clumsy-looking buildings with great tall chimneys and all around these were a lot of smaller houses this is your barrier sugar refinery cried the roosters the boy shuddered as he sat there on the goose's back he ought to have recognized this place for it was not very far from his home here he had worked the year before as a watch-boy but to be sure nothing was exactly like itself when one saw it like that from up above and think just think o osa the goose girl and little mats who were his comrades last year indeed the boy would have been glad to know if they still were anywhere about here fancy what they should have said had they suspected that he was flying over their heads soon jordberga was lost to sight and they travelled towards svedala and skaber lake and back again over göringe kloster and hekeberga the boy saw more of skåne in this one day than he had ever seen before in all the years that he had lived whenever the wild geese happened across any tame geese they had the best fun they flew forward very slowly and called down we're off to the hills are you coming along are you coming along but the tame geese answered it's still winter in this country you're out too soon fly back fly back 
the wild geese lowered themselves that they might be heard a little better and called come along we'll teach you how to fly and swim then the tame geese got mad and wouldn't answer them with a single honk the wild geese sank themselves still lower until they almost touched the ground then quick as lightning they raised themselves just as if they had been terribly frightened oh 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 they explained those things were not geese they were only sheep they were only sheep the ones on the ground were beside themselves with rage and shriek may you be shot the whole lot of you the whole lot of you when the boy heard all these teasing he laughed then he remembered how badly things had gone with him and he cried but the next second he was laughing again never before had he ridden so fast and to ride fast and recklessly that he had always liked and of course he had never dreamt that it could be as fresh and bracing as it was up in the air or that there rose from the earth such a fine scent of resin and soil nor had he ever dreamt what it could be like to ride so high above the earth it was just like flying away from sorrow and trouble and annoyances of every kind that could be thought of 